Hey guys. I always feel weird doing these Babylon 5 ruminations. If I can diverge for just a moment before I really get to the rumination proper. I've been feeling a huge amount of stress doing these videos. I, I know that sounds really weird. I'm sure you're over there like, oh, whatever, like you have a real job. But I'm serious. I, I feel a tremendous uh, pressure, I guess, to really put forth my best in this, to really give you something to think about. That's my job, after all. It's analysis, rumination. It's right there in the title. You know, the lore runner. It's all about the dissecting. It's all about the uh, deconstructing, right? But I feel like all I've been doing is just talking about it as is. You know, I, I don't really feel like I'm, I'm necessarily adding that much to the discussion. I'm not looking for fake praise. You know, I don't, I don't want you guys to lavish me with compliments or, or any other reason people uh, do that kind of stuff. I've just, I'm mentioning this because I have very few notes in my paper. And it's a shame because this is a really good episode, in my opinion. Now, a lot of that is in retrospect, you know, so we might have to save some of our discussion for the spoiler section of this particular episode. But nevertheless, for, for a really good episode and for, for some interesting concepts, I feel like there's not much to say about them. Maybe it's just because they're too apparent in my mind. So I never know what to talk about and what not to, where, where, where I'm being too obvious and where I'm being too obtuse. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I've actually talked about this with my sister recently, and she basically made me promise to be a little bit more myself and not try to worry too much about not being me. Uh, and that is kind of the direction I'm trying to take the show in in general. Uh, lately. I mean, I've always been doing that, but lately I'm trying to let go of that uh, self-doubt and confidence problem of being like, oh my god, you know, maybe I'm not doing a enough, good enough job. Maybe I should be more professional. Maybe I should be Angry Joe too. You know, maybe that is what I should be doing. But I, I, but I don't think that. I, I don't want to do that. She doesn't think I should do that. Uh, you know, I've talked to my fans. They don't think I should do this. I don't know, just just, just the concerns of, of someone who's, who's worried about doing the best he can. I just wanted to, to get that off my chest here. So I'm just going to talk uh, with my notes as a guideline, and, and we'll see what we get. This is a good episode, obviously. Um, I, a lot is actually established in this episode that will be relevant in the long term. I say that without fear of spoilers because... Even watching this, you're probably looking like, okay, yeah, this is this is clearly laying some brick down uh, for the eventual building. There's there's no denying that. I uh, the telepathy thing is really brought to the head in this one. Uh, this will also be the episode where I actually sit and discuss telepaths. Uh, sort of. We actually have to have one more telepath discussion after this. I'm gonna wait in that until that one until quite a bit later. But we're not getting there yet. We're, we're gonna save that until we get through the basic stuff. Um, but it does establish a lot of the baselines, how telepathy actually works from the perspective of the individual, uh, you know, the, the way that you can communicate through it, uh, the fact that you can get out both intention and literal words, the fact that you can block people, that there's such a thing as mental barriers and mental defenses, uh, the, the idea of scanning someone, the idea of power levels, and of course the, ability, the idea of telekinesis. Now, to explain this really, really briefly, and I just mentioned this because I've actually had a few people ask me about this, there is a difference between telepathy and telekinesis, okay? Telepathy is, you know, if I could speak to your brain or read your brain or otherwise do any of the things I just mentioned. Telekinesis is actually a completely different field. Uh, in, in most works of fiction, telepathy and telekinesis are actually hand in hand. Most people who are one are also the other. But when you actually think about it, the two are very, very different fields. Uh, tele tele telepathy is all about the mind, all about the interactions with the mind, the connections with the mind, the reading, the blocking, the scanning, all of that stuff. Tele telekinesis has nothing to do with the mind per se. I mean, you're using your mind to do it, but it's doing things like, you know, lifting a pen up or moving something or opening a door or closing a door or whatever. It is physically, tactilely interacting with reality around you, but using your mind instead of your hand is basically what that boils down to. Um, and we understand uh, from this episode a very important fact that helps establish certain things about how telepathy works amongst humans in particular. Uh, one in a thousand, I believe, was the number of t uh, humans are telepaths. And one in 10,000 telepaths have telekinetic abilities. And all of them are criminally insane. All of them are completely driven, you know, their minds don't work correctly as a result of their powers, as a result of the way that their minds are wired. Which is interesting, but I can't explain why. Um, until we get to the spoiler section. And I may forget about it. Let me make it out really quick. I don't want to forget about that. Uh, hang on just a second. Uh, live note-taking here. Uh, there we go. Okay, so, um, like I said, a lot of things are ooh, established in this episode. Um, I, I do want to talk about one thing really quick uh 
I've noticed in, in my own going through of Babylon 5, great show, by the way, I, I feel... I feel like I'm talking about concepts and tropes less than I did over in Voyager. And I think that's actually because Voyager is a better, as weird as this sounds, learning ground for writing than most works. Voyager is actually a great example of when it happens really right. And in terms of like character, in terms of personality, in terms of plot design, in, perhaps in terms of arcs, you know, there's tons and tons of ways that they do things right. And there's tons and tons of ways they do things wrong. And so it's a great show to discuss just writing and the creative process and the production of television and all that fun stuff. Um, because it's, it's such a great example of all of that. So I haven't really talked about that here, but I do have one thing I want to talk about here. And it's something I have actually mentioned over my Voyager stuff. It's the A plot, bleep, B plot segregation. So... For those of you not aware, the concept here, and this is this is much more prevalent in older television, although newer newer shows do this occasionally, is you have an A plot and a B plot. Now, standard uh, narrative uh, uh, rules, for lack of a better term, generally adhere that the A plot is the primary plot, the one that has the majority of the attention and is is generally bigger. I'm saying this wrong. Let me let me take that back. Rewind. The A plot is not the more relevant plot. The A plot is the bigger plot. It's the one like like if you had uh, an episode and it had a plot current of major character development and major political infrastructure of this world that's going to have long-reaching effects, and then you have a plot of the station or ship or planet or town or wherever your location is is being attacked by super doom things. This one would be the A plot because it's more in your face. It's more relevant. It's more. Uh, if I can use a weird parallel. If you could imagine that a T-Rex is on the loose, bear with me, and that's going to take most of your primary attention, right? That's the A-plot. But also, a few thousand miles away, a missile has been launched that will hit you in a few minutes. Now, that's the B-plot. Now, you're like, well, well, what's the difference? Well, think about this for a moment. The T-Rex is right there. You have to deal with it now. It's loud. It's present. It is visible. It is clear and present danger, to borrow the term. Um, not just from the book, but from the terminology, the doctrine. So the clear and present danger is, bam, right there, and it has to be dealt with loudly and noisily, a plot. The missile, well, you might not even be able to deal with the missile. You might only be able to mitigate it or subdue it or try to evacuate Maybe people are going to interact differently, knowing a missile's coming to it. Knowing that in an unknown period of time, you know that missile's in the air, but it's coming, and there's nothing you can do about it. How do people react to that? How do people function? You know, some, do you see some people going crazy? Do some people, you know, manning up or womaning up or whatever and, and becoming a hero? Do some people be cowards and just flee? That kind of more deep character drama can happen from a more subtle, less apparent, less clear and present threat. You with me? Now, I'm speaking in terms of threats. It doesn't have to be threats. But this is the concept in general. The A plot is, rah, and the B plot is back here in the background. Now, the funny thing is, uh, when you're doing something like this, you need to have... I, I'm trying to think of how best to put this. This episode actually has three plots. There are, there's an A, a B, and a C plot. And that's the weird thing, because this is a weird example of good and bad writing basically simultaneously. The C plot is Catherine and Sigma 957, I believe is the name of the planet. That's the C plot, not the B plot, believe it or not. It's clearly there to help flesh out her and Jakar more as a character. B both of them, you know, we get to see a little bit more of her, you know, stubbornness, her head stri strongness, etc. We get to see that Jakar is not just a bad guy. This is actually, I'd say, the first time in the series that we've seen Jakar do something that wasn't, uh, you know, manipulative or evil or, or generally, you know, the kind of thing you would associate with a bad guy actually genuinely reaching out to help her, which, of course, probably has some long-term political uh, ramifications, getting in good with someone who is as well-positioned as she is and who has the ear of Sinclair. It makes a degree of sense from a purely political perspective. But it's still a nice thing of him to do, so we're softening his character up, and that's great. The thing is, well, the reason I call this kind of bad writing is the C-plot has very, very little apparent relevance to anything. If you didn't, ha if you're watching this for the first time, you're probably wondering, why do I care? In fact, it looks like a thread of the week from the perspective of someone who's never seen this show before. Now, I, the way I'm saying this, I'm already giving some away, so forgive me. But yeah, Sigma nine five seven will be back in the future, and there will be more relevance to this in the future. This is establishing a little bit. This is uh, laying some some bricks for the future. Again, I don't really feel like that's spoiling, 
But at the time, it's just like, okay, she's in danger, but then she's not. It feels cheap a little bit. And it could have been woven in better, either in another episode or in this very episode. And to explain what I mean by that, let's talk about the A and the B plots, who are so well interwoven that you probably couldn't even tell they were two separate plots. The first is the plot of Jason Ironheart. Uh, am I saying that right? Actually, wrote his, yeah, Ironheart. I'm sorry, I was right. Jason Ironheart. I kept forgetting his name while I was making my notes, and I'm like, Who, what is his name? I kept having to look his name up again. Um, the first the A plot is Jason Ironheart's plot and his ascension. The B plot is the Psychor plot, which of course is almost, is so directly tied into that first plot that you might you may be mistaken for thinking they're the same one, but they're not. This is all about estab the B plot is all about establishing Bester, all about establishing the Psychor, about laying the threads of paranoia. For example, are Psychor actually out there trying to take over? Is this paranoiac ramblings? Are they beginning to do that? Are they doing that at the behest of the government? You know, is there someone in the government helping support the Psychor or vice versa? There's a lot of political intrigue that's just under the surface. They're brilliantly, brilliantly tied in and woven in to the primary, much louder A plot, which again is exactly how you should do an A and a B plot. Weave the two in together so they're almost seamless. Um, so yeah, the B plot really, really examines you know the t telepaths, uh, everything I mentioned earlier about establishing how telepaths work, uh, really going into more detail about the psychops uh, and the psychor in general. Uh, we get to see exactly what a scan actually looks like, and in, and the best part is, it's implied to be much ho more horrible than what we see. I mean, we just see a woman who's basically being traumatized, but with no actual understanding of what's happening. And yet we get the impression very, very clearly and strongly that, no, it is pretty bad, that she is suffering pretty horribly from that scan. In fact, it's funny because they didn't even have to show it on camera. Her reaction sold it all. She, she asked, you know, is that necessary? There's, there's just that moment of, oh, God, you know, they're going to scan me and, and how horrible that's going to be because she definitely does not want uh, to go through that. Um, I don't know, blame her uh, from what we understand about scanning. It is basically having your mind sifted through and it's pretty horrible. Not just painful, traumatizing. Imagine, if you will, that you're just, you're, you know, you're being scanned and suddenly you feel intense, severe pain and then anger and then fear and then, you know, just all these different neurons basically firing more or less at random, chaotically. Uh, I actually have a parallel to that myself. When I have a really bad fever, uh, I call it swimming. This is, this is something you know my family can attest to, or my friends can attest to. I've talked about this before. Uh, when I am swimming mentally, I have like no coherence. It is so difficult for me to rein my thoughts in. Um, you guys see how much I ramble, right? You guys see how much uh, uh, flow of thought, or, or um, uh, what, what do they call that? Motion of, uh, I can't remember what it's called. How much uh, my train of thought just kind of flows, right? That's normal for me. Now imagine that, except I have no control over it. It is a mess, and it's horrifying. It is genuinely horrifying. I try to knock myself out whenever I can when I have a bad fever because it is so traumatizing going through that. Now imagine that except it's much, much worse and being deliberately done to you. That's how I feel scanning works. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually true, but that, that, that's the interpretation I always got from it. And so we get to see all of that. And um, we, we also see, as Ivanova herself points out, who watches The Watchers? Now, of course, that's a, a long-standing question with, which has no answer, actually. Um, the idea of, you know, there's always got to be someone at the top, right? But we get the very strong impression that whether they're taking over or not, the Psychor are definitely the ones on the top. They are the ones who are actually watching everyone else. The enemies, the other al you know, aliens, other groups, the Martians, their own government, their own people, their own military. The Psychor are the ones policing everything and it's insidious and and you definitely get the impression we're going to be seeing more seeing more of that especially since bester lives by the way i'm going to pause for a moment before we discuss the a plot to talk about how freaking awesome bester is he is so brilliantly perfect for his role now the weird thing is upon rewatching it this is probably one of the weakest outings i've seen of walter walter koenig uh doing doing his bester role uh, here he comes across basically as a, a very classical uh, type uh, three, excuse me, type three villain. You know, the, the smug snake, as I like to call it. The, the smarmy, sneering, doesn't actually have any power. Yeah, whatever, I'll just... And you'll do what I have to say because have, and he'll be so completely pompous and arrogant, the whole time, you know, that kind of a thing, right? He comes across as that a little bit too harshly. 
But trust me, you know you're going to see Bester again in the future. He says it himself flat out, and it's Walter Koenig. We will be seeing him in the future, and trust me, he gets a lot better, uh, a lot more subtle. There's a lot more layers that are added to him, and he is a wonderful villain. Uh, weird thing, really quick, a side note. When I think of Walter Koenig, I actually tend to think Bester before anyone else. I, I identify him more as Bester than I do as Chekhov, for example, or, or anything else. Moontrap? Moon, we're not going to talk about Moontrap. Point being... <laughs> I really like him in his role as Bester. It was a treat seeing him again. I've, I've been looking forward to seeing him. Um, A-plot. So, yeah, the A-plot. Uh, the A-plot is, of course, the Ascension thing. And that is uh, something that... It's fairly typical science fiction, if I'm being honest, but the way it's presented was pretty good. Uh, the guy who played uh, Jason Ironheart did a good job of someone who was just barely holding on to, to, to classic human cognizance. Someone who was literally about to be exploding and have, having his mind expanded in a dozen different directions at once. And I just realized I can't talk much more about that until I get to the spoiler section. <laughs> but I just do want to say that that is, again, a classic A-plot thing. It's all about him, his interactions with Talia, his interactions with Sinclair, his threat to the station, uh, the the, their, their decision to go ahead and aid him, even at their own risk, you know. And it's a quiet, quiet little thing, despite all of that, that the A-plot actually reinforces Babylon 5's message in and out of character. The reaching out of the hand, the, uh, the olive branch. There, this is someone who, for all intents and purposes, Babylon 5 crew would be fully justified in calling him their enemy in fighting against him and not working with him and just treating him as if he's a bad guy because he has caused harm and he has caused death and he is doing so here to them knowingly, unintentionally, but still knowingly. He, you know, he understood the risks coming here. But they don't. They they suffer the, uh, the wound. They really reach their hand out to him and it works out in the end and that's awesome. And again, the message of B5 in a nutshell. Um... I do like how we see a lot of people's reactions to... Well, not a lot of people. We see several characters' reactions to telepaths in general and the psy in particular. We already know how Ivanova feels. She laid that out very clearly when she was talking to Talia. Uh, I forget how many episodes ago, but some episodes ago. Uh, we also get to see uh, Garibaldi, who is interesting... Because he's his usual, you know, detective, efficient, figuring things out, just bam, 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 re really getting on top of the, the mystery and getting it solved as quickly as possible. But by his own admission, he's doing it because he doesn't want everything to do with it. He, uh, this is, again, reinforcing what will eventually be the strongest parts of Garibaldi's character. His, his more or less, and I mean the no insult by this, his simple-mindedness. He's very down-to-earth. He's very normal. He, he likes Looney Tunes. <laughs> you know. Um, Duck Dodgers. And... Uh, and so it makes sense that someone who has something like telepathic powers would just make him just generally uneasy. And he, you know, good guys, bad guys, on his side, against his side, he just wants them gone. And I liked that. And of course, Sinclair himself takes a very hard line when it comes to telepaths. You get the impression rather strongly that Sinclair's actually dealt with the Psychor in particular, and telepaths in general in the past, and yeah. Um, I, uh... Two more th not thoughts, uh, actually three more thoughts, excuse me, before I get to the spoiler section. First of all, I really like the fact that telepaths show up for deals. I know this isn't the first time this has shown up, but this is the first time I really felt it was worth talking about. Because this is the first time a telepath has sat in on a deal between two people, you know, against the protagonist characters, against the characters we're supposed to be rooting for, in this case against Catherine, uh, to verify the validity of her statements. I like that. Now, th again, this has been established before, but I like it because it showcases the culture that telepathy adds to the setting. Or if I could phrase this another way, one of the things I like most about fiction is when you add something new to an otherwise normal human-style society. You know, you take, you know, the culture of, of any given civilization that we have a standard for in real life, and you add something to the mix, I love seeing how that changes the mix. I love seeing how many different things vary based on this fictional alteration that has now caused a discrepancy. The fact that telepaths are normal to be present at these kind of meetings, the fact that everyone just kind of has gone to accept the fact that there's going to be a telepath at these meetings, it's interesting, especially since, given the fairly clear uh, overtones and undertones, actually, of uh, economic... 
economics. I think I'm just going to put it that way. You know, the general unscrupulous nature of the corporations and economies of, of, of EarthGov, at the very least, uh, but some of the other nation, uh, worlds and species as well. It's interesting that the fact that being able to tell the truth is considered a baseline requirement for, for signing major deals like that, for, for uh, doing scavenging runs or major shipping runs or trade runs or whatever, you need to have a telepath present to verify that both sides are being honest. I find that fascinating. I don't have much else to add to it. It's just, again, it's that interesting little variance thing. I actually, actually, if I might divulge for just a second, I actually once wrote an entire story uh, in my head. I still haven't written it down on, on paper, but I still remember it. Uh, called slight variance, and it was literally a completely standard Earth, except one little change had been ha well, okay, one major change had happened, and seeing how everything just kind of went off kilter very, very quickly as as society adapted to this change. Um, for those curious, the change was certain people were rather suddenly turned into uh, fully android versions of themselves, and a few other things. It was kind of weird. Anyways. Uh, Next thing I want to talk about, the telepathic romantic connection. Now, you guys know that I'm not a huge guy in romance. I hate romance, uh, especially with Morgan. That's just terrible. <laughs> but I, I admittedly am not usually a huge fan of romance in my fiction. That's, that's just preference. Uh, nothing against that, nothing for that. But I have always been, a, a, admittedly, as a result of that, I'm always more critical when romance is added into a fictional work. It's like, okay, if you're going to do it, do it right. That is also one of the reasons why I heap so much praise on the times when they do it right. Probably my favorite example ever for this is actually Keiko and O'Brien over in TNG and DS9. The fact that they got that relationship right, arguably the only, well, one of two relationships in Star Trek history they actually got right. You know, bravo, props. Excuse me. Um, I like what they did here. The fact that, I mean... Again, this is Babylon 5. I'm going to be discussing stuff I don't normally like discussing. Sex, okay? We're just going to say it. Sex is something very vulnerable. It can be. Let's add that. Can be something very vulnerable. When you are lovemaking, when you are connecting to someone physically like that, you are opening yourself up to them. You are at your most vulnerable state, physically, mentally, emotionally. The, something said wrong, something done wrong, it can be hurtful, it can be damaging, it can destroy your self-esteem or your confidence. You know, there's so many ways in which you can be hurt. But after, but in the act of opening yourself so much, that's why you connect so much with that person, or at least, again, can connect with so much with that person. And, uh, and really be yourself and, you know, all those things that love is supposed to be, right? I like the idea of that being taken to the next level with two telepaths because it's everything that we as as normal fleshy mundane uh, you know humans have but you add the mental connection aspect to it you add the fact that they can literally connect one with another their minds their emotions so you're feeling what they're feeling they're thinking what you're thinking and it's not just your your uh, your bodies but in in a very literal way your souls are being bared one to another to the point where well, to be put it bluntly, we don't actually have an equivalent in real life for how connected that could become. And again, I keep adding that word could, can, might. Um, I like that they added that. If my first reaction was when she started talking about them being lovers, which was, oh, really? But they did a good thing with it. And I like where they went with it, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, so I mentioned months, months and months and months ago that when I get to Babylon 5, I might just pause to discuss, you know, a concept that was done in it. And in this case, we're actually going to discuss uh, briefly, again, briefly, uh, a, a telepathy. Now, this is interesting because telepathy is very common in science fiction, specifically science fiction. I find that fascinating in many ways, since it tends to be somewhat more absent in fantasy, even though telepathy is in many ways, sh you know, it, it shows the, um, the signs and symbols and otherwise uh, hallmarks of fantasy more than it does science fiction. I have a theory of why that is, and I've had this theory for some time. The idea is, you know, magic is something that you reach out and you pull and you change reality with your will, you know, to create fire or change things or whatever, you know, whatever. Um, and fantasy creatures and alien creatures that, that are just mystical and magical, you know, that kind of a thing, uh, has a different feel than something that is deliberately and strictly produced from your mind. 
I feel like this is the key point here. It's one of the reasons why I've always felt uh, psionics in you know, Dungeons & Dragons, to use an example, has felt like a little bit more of a science fiction thing than a pure fantasy thing because of the fact that it, it, it's produced from the mind just like science in general is, just like the very concept of science fiction is all about the speculations of what we can accomplish with our minds. It's all about the technology, the cultures, the society, the pr production of people and advancement uh, uh, in, in terms of evolution, in terms of mutation, in terms of uh, you know, the way science and reality works, hence the term science fiction. Uh, this is just my interpretation, of course. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts, as I always do. Uh, but uh, And, of course, there are certain works which really blend the line between science fiction and fantasy. Star Wars is a great example of this. Farscape is a great example of this. There are others. Um, but you will almost f always find that in things that are clearly and definitively science fiction over here, mind powers are much more common. Star Trek is a great example of this. Star mind powers, in the generic sense, have been a part of Star Trek since the original series. Um, and uh, the Foundation series of books by Isaac Asimov are another good example of mind powers being in an otherwise fairly hard science work. Um, Babylon 5 itself is kind of odd because, and I don't mean this in any way of spoilery, but telepathy, mind powers, that kind of thing, are going to be a very strong recurring thing throughout basically the entire series. And in some cases, uh, I remember when I first was watching this show, I remember thinking, oh, wow, really, you're go really going all in on this mind power stuff, aren't you? I'm speaking generically so as not to spoil stuff, but, you know, it's the telepathy, tele you know, etc. stuff. But you're really going all in on this. And it's weird because other than the mind power stuff, Babylon 5 is actually very down to earth. Uh, I'm reminded, of course, of Mass Effect, which, by the way, is another great example of what I'm talking about. The uh, uh, biotics, you know, space magic. Uh, biotics are in many ways very similar to the telepathy, telepathy thing, especially amongst the Asari and the way that they work. Now, biotics kind of blur the line a little bit and actually have an in-lore explanation. But then again, telepathy actually has an in-lore explanation in Babylon 5 as well, which I'm not going to discuss here because I'm not at the spoiler section yet. I don't want to get into that. Um, but uh, I, I, I feel like introducing telepathy in this way is a very interesting choice on the behalf of the writers. Because if you're going to do something like that, you have to do something with it. Now, Babylon 5 does do something with it. In fact, it does two things with it. Uh, right off the top of my head that we can already talk about right now, first and most important thing, is it gives us something like the Psychor, who watches the Watchers. That one line explains the Psychor so well. They are at the top of the heap. They're the ones watching everyone else. And there is a slew of possibilities to do with, of, of what you can do with that writing-wise. You can have uh, stories about the moral conflicts. You can show the generation of individuals, the corruption of, cor of governments, the corruption of a system. The idea of a, uh, a blameless system where no individual in the system is at fault, but everyone involved contributes to the fault. You know, that kind of a thing. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. The second thing I like that they do with that is the victimization. Anybody who's watched my stuff at all probably knows that I really, really love Dragon Age. Dragon Age Origins most especially, but Dragon Age in general. And one of the things I love about the Dragon Age thing, and I've, I've started kind of... <laughs> you, you guys know I have my own terms, you know, the droid effect, for example. One of the things I'm starting to start... I, I think I'm going to term right here and now is, the, is, the, is the, uh, the mage effect or something like that. I'll have to come up with a better term. Maybe I'll just go with the mage effect. The mage effect is based off of Dragon Age Origins. Namely, you are a mage. You have magical power. You're, you're born to it. You don't have a choice. You have magic power in you. And you're screwed. As of that moment, the moment you're born, you're screwed. Because it is possible for you to live a normal life as a mage. Possible. What is more likely is you will not have the training necessary to really use it properly, and you will cause a lot of harm to those around you because demons will pop in and be like, Hi! Nom, nom, nom. Um, so, you know, simply by being a mage, you're a victim. Not, and, and I mean this before we even get to anything about the, the Chantry or the Templars or anything. No, it's ignore all that. Before any of that starts, you are a victim by pure circumstance of birth. Congratulations. You now have a curse. Have fun. 
Uh, I myself have used the mage effect in, uh, in, my, in my work several times, but the most obvious one you might know of is in Primus, the desolation. You, you're not, you're, you're, you don't want to be a desolate. You don't choose to be when you're born one, and people hate you for it. They don't even know why they hate you for it. They invent reasons. They invent bigotry and, 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 and vile and vitriol just to hate you because they have to, because it's, it's natural. It's, it's the, the reaction to desolation. Um, telepaths don't have it quite as badly as the two examples I just gave, but they still have it badly. A telepath who doesn't know how to control themselves can, can cause a fairly large amount of damage to themselves and those around them, can degenerate into insanity, can go on murder sprees, and we, we hear all, uh, we, we hear different examples of this kind of thing. There's a reason telepaths are marked and tracked very early on. And if a telepath is actually found, and we already heard this, they're given a choice. You join the Psychor, so you're part of the system now, which is an option. But it, again, it's the equivalent of joining the mage, uh, a mage circle over in Dragon Age. So, you know, there's problems associated with that. Um, so you become part of the problem. You become part of the system and part of the problem. Uh, you take drugs which, which veg, vegetize you forever uh, or you die. <laughs> this is pretty much your only options, really. Um, they will not allow any, any variance on this. Now, in the case of telepaths, part of that is because the Psychor wants control over the situation. Government, people in government, people in power want control of the telepath situation. But it is worth noting there is a genuine threat to a random, uncontrolled telepath. Especially since, as we just discussed in this episode, one in 10,000 telepaths is a telekinetic. Uh... Hang on, I need some quick math. So that's 10,000, uh, 100,000, a million, 10 million. So one in 10 million people, roughly, is a telekinetic. Now, that may, now you may be like, oh, wow, what the crap, who cares, right? Think about how many people are on Earth. Try to remember that Earth, uh, humanity is not limited to just Earth in this setting. And think about how many people are, uh, are hum human people are in the galaxy in Babylon 5. One in ten million is a significant risk when you look at things from a civilization or species level. So having one random person in ten million born who can just kind of kill and destroy things around them without being properly contained, that's a problem. And you can see why they do that. Now, of course, you know, the Psychor is obviously trying to advance that and make a controlled, proper tele telekinetic. But uh, that's, that's a whole other thing. And honestly, I've already really talked about that. You know, they just want to be on top of the heap even more. They want to retain uh, that position as the apex predator of, of human society. As uh, Palpatine would say, those who have power uh, are, are afraid of losing it. <clears throat> so that's all I wanted to discuss with the tele... Uh, oh, wait, actually, I wanted to discuss... Sorry, I, I didn't quite keep going there. Uh, one thing that I kind of got derailed on there. So the in introduction of telepathy. You know, you, you do it for a reason, right? Uh, you, you have mind powers for a reason. Um, one of the other reasons I like... I just realized I can't talk about that. I can't talk about the other reason I like telepathy and, and, and whatnot. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and do the spoiler section. You ready for this? Okay, spoilers. Whoops, whoops, whoops. You've been warned. You know how this works. Spoiler section. Okay, so to continue the thought I just said, the other thing they did with the telepathy that I really like is the Vorlons. The fact that telepathy is an engineered trait. And the, ver the whole concept of telepathy does not naturally occur in sentient or sapient species not only makes a lot of sense to me, but uh, really, really helps flesh out the Vorlons and how horrible they are. Uh, I've said before, and I'll say again, I personally think the Vorlons are actually worse than the Shadows. Uh, in several ways, especially since they are a far more insidious uh, sort of a threat. And that brings me back to what I was talking about earlier, which uh, I wrote down... Did I write the note? Nope, I thought I did. Yeah, yeah, the tele... Okay, so I, I meant it how interesting it is that, you know, it, it, uh, the telekinetics are so rare. Uh, I found myself wondering if that was deliberately engineered that way, or if they were supposed to be more common and they just kind of failed, since we know humans are not the most receptive race towards the telepathic uh, genes, for lack of a better term, uh, of the various races out there. So it makes me wonder uh, what they were going with, going with for that one. Um, the uh, interesting little side note, there's a gentleman in this episode named Jack. I, I, I can't talk about this without doing it in the spoiler section because 
just mentioning that there's this guy there named Jack. He's not even named in the episode. He's the guy who bring, uh, greets Bester and uh, Lieutenant Expendable uh, at the very beginning of the episode. He's, uh, some of you may recognize him as Garibaldi's aide. Some of you may recognize him as the freaking traitor who shoots Garibaldi in the back um, later on in the series. Uh, spoiler alert, obviously, that's why we're talking about it here. I find a couple things interesting about it. Uh, first of all, the fact that he has clear connections to the Psy Corps. He has no problem whatsoever taking telepathic orders. He's the only one who demonstrates that trait, actually. Uh, so I, it, it adds to a theory I've long since had that he was actually working on the side of the Psy Corps, not necessarily Clark. Although, given that Clark uh, has some pretty clear dis and distinct connections to the Psy Corps, it's possible those two statements aren't incongruent. It's possible that they are one and the same. Uh, but I personally always had that impression that he was part of the Psy Corps plot to take over more than Clark's plot to take over. And, and again, they may be the same plot. But I think it's interesting this is his first appearance here, and they're already planting some seeds there with that. Um, uh, speaking of, of the Vorlon, sorry, I should have led with this, cause I'm stupid. Uh, I personally think it is absolutely certain that, uh, deliberately or otherwise, the Psy Corps is was doing all those experiments on Jason Ironheart with Vorlon tech, with Vorlon knowledge. Uh, either that they stole or that they procured or whatever, uh, it is entirely within reason that this was something the Vorlons wanted to do in order to try and expand the level of telepathic and telekinetic power within the human race to be able to use them as a tool more in the upcoming war. Um, I mentioned that, though, because I've heard some people postulate that they're actually working with Shadow Tech as, as well, which, which is also feasible, although Shadow Tech tends to lead it more towards the uh, organic technology side of things. But still possible. I'm curious what you guys think um, with regards to that. Uh, so, Talia. <laughs> poor. Oh, poor Talia. I, this episode, more than most I've seen, really makes my heart go out to her. Her end. Oh, I feel so bad for her, especially considering that at this point in time, I, I don't remember if it's absolutely established. Really, I don't. But I believe that she's already ha she already has control in her as of this moment, as of this point in time. Uh, considering what I talked about about her being the replacement control character for the other woman uh, from the from the pilot, I feel like it is very likely she's already there. And so yeah, she's already doomed. And whew. um. Really makes me feel for her. Uh, the, of course, Jason Ironheart's last talk comment about "I'll see you in a million years" uh, was probably not vague, or no, I shouldn't say vague. It probably wasn't uh, generalizing. He probably means that literally, uh, considering what we know, what happens with regards to humanity and their eventual ascension to, you know, the next stage of life, which happens forever from now uh, in Babylon Five, which we'll be covering whenever we get there, like season four, I want to say, or is it three? I don't remember. Um, it's not among my favorite episodes when they cover that. So, so then we have last thing I want to talk about in the spoiler section is Sigma Nine Five Seven, home to one of the only uh, first ones who who are still walking around. The Walkers. Uh, actually, fun fact: I went a little looking into this to see what their official name is. They don't have one. <laughs> There is no official name for the walkers of Sigma 957. Uh, I adopted that term myself you know, years ago, uh, I believe from a few friends and, and other fans online, and apparently that is just a fan name for them. Uh, according to uh, um, JMS, uh, Straczynski, he, uh, he, there's actually a name for them that he's never actually written down because it's like 15,000 characters or some ridiculous thing like that. Uh, I do think it's interesting that they established them this early on. And again, this is why the C-plot is relevant for long-term stuff, but just had nothing to do with anything else. I, I, I really find it odd that they just kind of shoved it in there randomly. Uh, but then again, that is, that's you know, a bit of bad writing, if I'm being honest, like I discussed last time. So that's all I got. Hopefully this was an enjoyable episode, despite having very little to talk about. I will see you guys at the next episode next week. Hopefully.